Heavenly Father, as uh, Russell breaks the word of life for us at this time, we ask that you would uh, give him your Holy Spirit, enlighten his mind, um, touch his lips with uh, coals from your altar, and do whatever you can to awaken us to hear your voice. Um, it's been a long week, um, and we're, we've heard a lot of information, but um, we're here. We want to hear what all you have for us, so open our ears, and we ask for a blessing at this time, as you've done from the very beginning of this school. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone. Um, if we remember that um, the message concerning the 2300 days when Israel were captive, or the, or the time when Daniel were, 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 cap, were captive in um, Babylon, the angel Gabriel was sent and respond to, to his request as to the reason why they were still in captivity, though the time was fulfilled, the 70 years were fulfilled. And if you remember that um, um, the angel had given him the specific time that they would come out of Babylon based on the decree to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. And if you'll remember some of the things we spoke about concerning Gabriel's work, that he, he guided the prophecy all the way through, even down to this very last days that we're living in. Um, Gabriel's work is still a part of our or part of the influence in our experience. You remember that um, John the Baptist, his father, was instructed by Gabriel to prepare John the Baptist to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And it is the message of, Ellen White said, it is the message of um, Daniel, Daniel 9 that the angel used to instruct John or to instruct John's father in relation to Christ's coming and the preparation. In fact, when the disciples went out preaching, the time was fulfilled. She says it was based on Daniel 9. So Daniel's message was important in the revival or uh, the reformation of um, Israel, or the preparation of Israel. And if you remember that Christ came and the work that he did under the church of Ephesus, um, this, that church was known as a conquering church. Um, if you'll go with me, I believe, to Revelation chapter 2, and the church of Ephesus, which... The pioneers have as AD 27 to AD 100. Um, but I'd like to include Christ's preparation as part of the Ephesus exp experience. So I, I tend to look at it from AD 1 to AD 100. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has, sorry, and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Um, the Church of Ephesus, remember the great work that it did under the, under the, um, the disciples. But following the Church of Ephesus, um, the Church of Smyrna 
um, beginning from 100 to the, to the time period of 313. Now the power that, 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 that the power of the Ephesus church became part of the experience of the Smyrna church, but strange things begin to happen under the church of Smyrna. And if you will go with me to Revelation 2, verse 9. Um, speaking of the church of Smyrna, he says, I know thy works and, and tribulation and poverty, but thou, art, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, the, two, the, 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 message, the message at the point in time was to, to the Smyrna church was... Um, the Christian message was becoming so popular that it was attracting even the pagans into the churches. And um, to a great degree, those pagans weren't converted. They were coming into the church um, because of the popularity of Christianity at that time. And according to the pioneers, um, they, were so, they were so zealous um, Basically, in fact, Haskell refers to, to them as, as those who were, who, who were practicing righteousness by works, basically, and um, to the point that they, they were prepared to become martyrs, feeling that in, the, in martyrdom, there was the, 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 it, would please, it would please the creator. And... Um, this brought about problems for Diocletian, the emperor at the time, and as a result of that, he issued the decree of, of, um, of he issued a death decree against the church, and the church was persecuted for ten years. Um, in verse ten of the of the chapter, it says, "Fear not, fear none of those things which the, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you." into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten, ten days. But thou, sorry, be thou faithful unto, the, unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The ten years persecution in the church was followed by the conversion of Constantine, and Constantine came into the church. When Constantine came into the church, he... Um, his conversion um, brought about great rejoicing in the Christian world. As Ellen White describes it, she says that um, though it, look, it looked like paganism had lost, the, had lost the, the battle, but it's really the church that had lost the battle. As Constantine, um, as, the, as the world cloaked with Christian garments, entered the church her customs and her ceremonies got control of the church. Um, she says, she says, the nominal, the nominal conversion of Constantine, and that's coming from Great Controversy, page 49, the nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the fourth century caused great rejoicing, and the world cloaked with a form of righteousness walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed, Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, um, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. Um, as a result of that, this experience that the church or the power that the church was, had, had inherited from the Ephesus church began to diminish. The spiritual power of the church began to diminish and it went down to an all-time low and it was necessary for the Lord to resurrect the church again. And this is about the, this is about the time that this... Well, let me go into um, page 50 of the Great Controversy before I carry on. She says, The compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in the prophecy as opposing them exalting himself um, above God. Um, 
the compromise between paganism and Christianity which Constantine paved the way for resulted in the church falling away as the Apostle Paul stated and, the, and that paved the way for the man of sin. If you remember, well, I wanted you to go with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 and we read that verse 5 and read this earlier, earlier this morning. I, um, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard a, th I heard a, sorry, I heard a, a, I heard the third beast say, I'm going to just read that again. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, <clears throat> and lo, a black horse, and he that sat upon him had a pair of balances in his hand. Um, this is the point in time where the man of sin or the, the, um, the church was made by Justinian the corrector of heretics and, and really the, the church claimed the right to judge the consciences of men. A false balance was in the hands of, in the hands of those, those who claimed to have the power to judge the conscience. Um, this is under the third seal, and if you will notice that this, it coincides with the Church of Pergamos. And if you remember, the Church of Pergamos um, is a point in time where um, the transition was taking place between pagan Rome and papal Rome. If you will go with me to Daniel 11, um, Daniel 11, verse 30. These are verses that we have been covering here in the prophecy school. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Um, this is pointing to the, to, to, to the transition taking place when, first of all, pagan Rome was grieved, and that, and that grief, papal Rome inherited it. And the papacy found itself, um, after Constantine kingdom had broken up into, into, um, into the ten divisions, the papacy found itself with the three obstacles in her way, which she had problems overcoming. Um, and she needed arms, according to verse 31. Verse 31 says, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Um, Clovis was the arms that stood on the papacy's part, and 508, the battle between Clovis and the Visigoths, um, was a deciding was was a deciding battle that um, influenced Justinian to put his armies in support of the papacy. Um, <clears throat> as a result of that, the papacy the papacy gained control of, of Europe. It it took thirty years for the papacy to acquire this control. But I want to point you to a point in time to, 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 uh, which is very significant and that will, that will be repeating itself several times and that is the time period of 533. In 533, um, and, I, and I mentioned it earlier on but I did not connect it with, it, connected it with, um, with the time period. 533, Justinian issued the decree that the church should become the corrector of heretics. Right at that point in time, oops, right at, at that point in time, there is a division taking place. Um, it, is, it, will, it is not seen until we, we, uh, when we arrive at the, at the next church, Thyatira, but there is a division taking place where, um, and I have to allude to it, where one class continues in a revival that is taking place. Um, the message of Daniel, when uh, I don't have the quotation with me at this point in time, but it's taken is from the book of uh, the books of the book of Acts, and Ellen White says that that the Apostle Paul had prepared the church for that time, for that period when the man of sin would be attempting to put himself in the place of God, and the church was being prepared for 
that period when that would happen. In fact, in fact, the church, the church, the church expected that man of sin. They knew that that power would be far more dangerous than pagan Rome itself. However, when that time period came, um, the preparation was well on the way in the, in the hearts of God's people. And Daniel, Revelation 11, pointing to that preparation that was complete in the hearts of God, God's people. If you go to Revelation 11, chapter, verse 3. Revelation 11, verse 3. It states, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clove in sackcloth. Notice that the papacy gained control over Europe in 538. 538, represented by this point here on this graph. Um, uh, you, may be, you may notice the, the, the time period at, at, the, at the very top here. 538, the papacy gained control. And one class, one class represented by this top part of the graph here were prepared for what was to follow. Um, another class came fully under the control of the papacy or the doctrine of the papacy. So what followed was a persecution, a persecution on the papal Rome in the following church, which was the church of Thyatira, which lasted from 538 to 1798. If you will, um, if you will go back, go across, the, go across to the church of Smyrna, and I want to, I want to point out to you that um, as a result of the, the false conversions that, were, that, were, that, were, that was being developed under the Church of Smyrna, two classes, again, were developed. A, a, a class that the, the pioneers referred to as who were, who were considered to be practicing the correct religion and the true religion, true conversion of the heart, righteousness by faith, um, and another class who were righteousness by works. And as a result of that, persecution developed. And I want you to notice what happened after the persecution was that a falling away developed when Constantine walked into the church and, produced, and provided a safe haven for the church. There were 10 years persecution of, uh, on the Diocletian. Following that, when Constantine took over, um, providing a, a safe haven, a safe sanctuary for the church, the church began to diminish in spiritual power. And that pattern develops as we move along. If you will notice again that um, as the church climbed in spirituality by the preparation of the message, the message of Daniel, um, the two classes are developed by the work of, by the mystery of iniquity. And again, there's a persecution that took place in the, in, in the dark ages. 1260 years resulted in a bloodbath as the people of God were persecuted by those who were born of the flesh. Those who were born of the spirit were persecuted by those who were born of the flesh. But I want to point out to you that straight after that time period, 1798, um, what is seen rising is the United States of America. The lamb-like beast is rising. And like, like under the church of Smyrna, Smyrna following the persecution on the um, following the persecution on the, on the Constantine, the church diminishing spiritual power as a result of the safe haven that Constantine more or less provided for the church. Um, so after the church of, following the, following the persecution under the church of Thyatira, uh, the church of Sardis, the two classes again mingling together as a result of that, the, the church diminished in spiritual power. When you, when you read up concerning the, the Church of Sardis, you'll see this is the message concerning Sardis. Sardis basically became a sleeping church. Um, but then the same pattern, the same pattern is repeated again, as in the case of, as in the case of Smyrna, um, the, message, the message of Daniel is used to resurrect the church. So it is concerning the Philadelphia church. Remember that the, the, the Philadelphians, as they studied the message of Daniel, um, Daniel 8 and 9, a revival began. 
the revival, um, the revival or the reformation that was taking place in, in God's church resulted again as we come up to the time period of 1833, and I want you to notice, um, sorry, 1840. If you look at this line of 1840 and the line of 533, you will notice, you will notice that um, it represents the line where the two classes are being divided, are, are, are dividing, they're separating from each other. Um, and that seemed to be, a, that's a pattern that is, that, that, that is set up in the word of God. Um, 1840, we've been, we've been doing a lot concerning 1840, and you, you, now, you now know what is happening in 1840, and you understand that this is the point in time that Jesus referred to as the budding trees of spring when the two classes are separated. Um, <clears throat> they're separating because of the increase of knowledge that is, that is coming to the people of God, and, and the foolish do not comprehend it. Um, and by now, you should be able to recognize the pattern as if you, if you consider what happened under Thyatira and even what happened under Smyrna, you can see the same thing developing under Philadelphia. Um, the, the separation began, one class continued in spiritual growth as we come up to the time period of 1843, the blessed hour, whereas um, the other class more or less remain on this same plane. Again, um, I should really have gone to these, those scriptures. Maybe we can go to it, um, to Galatians chapter 4, verse 29, and Galatians chapter 4, verse 23. Verse 23, first of all, it says there, but he who was of the born woman um, was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was of promise. And verse 29 states, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him <clears throat> that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And um, this, is the, this is the text that the pioneers use in relationship to the two classes that develop under the church of Smyrna. And as we looked, that, is, that was applicable. Those two, those two scriptures were applicable to the to the two classes under the church of Thyatira and the two classes developed under the church of Philadelphia. Um, and of course, you know the result. What followed, what followed, that, what followed, was, the, what followed was the persecution, as always, the persecution. He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. 1844, the two classes separated. But Again, what followed 1844 is the same thing that followed the church of Smyrna. See, what happened, remember that the church, the church under persecution remains pure, more or less. And when the church is in a, in, in a, in a place where it is um, not active, it is, it, it is, it, it, Everything is, everything is smooth and easy going. Usually, um, the spirit, spirituality drops. And this was the case on the Constantine as the, as the church was no longer suffering persecution, but it was lifted up. This was the case of Sardis as the church had found its freedom in the United States of America to worship of, according to the dictates of its conscience. And the same, again, is following the, the Philadel following the Philadelphian church, the church of Laodicea. Laodicea comes out, and as a result of the two classes, again, mingling together, there is a drop in spiritual power. Did, did I hear you say that the revival of Ephesus, Pergamos, and Philadelphia were all brought about by the book of Daniel? By the book of Daniel, yes. So Laodicea, um, diminishes in spiritual power. We know that, of, of course, we, when, when, we, um, list, when, when, 
We examine the Laodicean message Christ refers to us as naked, wretched, and blind. Um, but as in the previous histories, what follows, what follows the, the decline in spiritual power is a resurrection or a message of reform to bring the church back up to her spirituality. And therefore, we see the, the events of 1989 or Daniel 11, 40 to 45, being the book that is the portion of the prophecy that is sent to revive the church, that comes into the experience of the church, the revival of the church. But um, remembering that um, the, experience, the experience of the Pergamos church and the experience of the Philadelphian church are combined on the church of um, the church of Laodicea in the resurrection of the, the church of, of Laodicea in, 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 um, in bringing her in that, that, that experience that, that um, well let's, let's put it this way in, in manuscript releases when Ellen White deals with the history of the, of the Pergamos church she says much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated and in, in relationship to the, to, the, um, to the Philadelphian, she says that the ten versions will be repeated to the very letter. So as we combine those two, those two churches, we have an understanding as to um, how, the re, how the revival is coming into the experience of the, the Laodicean church. Um, is everyone following me so far? Okay. Um, Remembering that, again, as the two classes are, as the two classes are being developed, we come up to this line of separation. This line of separation that runs right through the churches, from Smyrna all the way down to Pergamos to Philadelphia and to Laodicea, this line of separation where the increase of knowledge is not benefiting the foolish virgins. The foolish virgins should comprehend the book of Daniel, should comprehend the, the little book, but it's not comprehending it. Um, if you will go with me to Revelation chapter, chapter 10, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clove with a cloud, and the rainbow was, a, was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the, sun, the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when the lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, this angel, obviously, he descends, he descends at, that point in, at this point in time with the increase of knowledge concerning the little book. And um, concerning the little book, which is crucial for, if, which, is, which is crucial, and this is present truth, is, is, it is crucial for the two classes. Remember that the seven thunders that was uttered from the little book, Ellen White said, was a delineation of, of events that were to transpire under the first and second angel's messages. The delineation of events um, Was, is, is, uh, well, I have to, let, me, let me take you back to the Philadelphian time period because really and truly what we just read in Revelation 10 um, points to that time period here, 1840, where this angel descended with the increase of knowledge. And I want to, the reason why I chose this, um, I, chose to, I chose this graph here to, to show you the importance of the book of Daniel in the experiences of the churches and how the book of Daniel has been used to resurrect the church from its um, backsliding position. Um, 
but the emphasis I want to place on the emphasis I want to place is on the little book, and that is the reason why I'm using this um, this graph here. Once you once you see the importance of the book of Daniel, how it resurrected the uh, Pergamos Church, the Philadelphian Church, and now the Laodicean Church, um, and as you recognize the line of separation that took place in those churches. Uh, um, you should begin to see the importance of this little book in our Christian experience, as it comes into our Christian experience. And I, and I want to dwell. I want to dwell. Um, I want to dwell um, continually on this little book because I because I believe that we need to understand the importance of this, this of this little book, how it figures in both the Millerites' time period and in our time period as it repeats itself. So I've gone over this part of it before and I want to go over it again. Um, I, I would have to quote from, from my head at this point in time because I don't have the quotations um, in my hand. So, but I've, I've, they, are, they are on tape and Jeff have used them extensively so you should be able to um, locate them if you have a problem. Um, Concerning the little book in the angel's hand. She says, that the seven, when the angel came down with the little book open in his hand, he uttered the seven thunders. And the seven thunders, Ellen White says, was a delineation of events that were to transpire under the first and second angel's messages. She says, the unsealing of the little book, and the angel descends here. He's descending, as I said, on this line of separation. He's descending here, um, as I said before, because of what is transpiring at that point in time. Um, at that point in time, remember that, and I just want to refresh your memory, remember that there was an angel, there was, there, there, there was an angel saying to the Islamic, the Islamic movement that is moving across the globe, and this, this movement um, is, you know, it's, 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 um, a, it's, it's a threat in a sense to, to the people of God and, and the angel says to this power this, to this power he says to the, to the four angel, angels who was given to hurt the earth to hurt not the earth nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead this angel comes to seal the servants of God and remember that at that point in time here and I spoke about it this morning this point in time um you have to visualize that there is, there, is an, there is an angel, a ceiling angel there, and there is an angel of the bottomless pit right there in 1840. And what we alluded to, that the, the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is, is, is bringing a class of people up to this time period. Um, a people who are, who are Faithful, faithful to God, but to a great degree, they're carrying the papal, the papal doctrine in them. They don't understand, they don't understand fully what, it, what it's about, but um, what all of the issues are about. But they're responding to the message of God. But there's another class, there's another class, who obviously, who, as Ellen White says, they, they would move from impulse to classes of people, um, symbolize this whole movement that is symbolized by the beast that is coming up out of the earth. And in that time period here, there is a separation to take place in this little book. This little book is the reason for it, in that one class is being sealed by the sealing angel, the angel of the east. Now, the events, what I want to talk about here is the events that is transpiring on the, the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages. If, as Jeff said, the first angel's message was given in 1840, um, I want to consider those, those events because she says this, the events that are transpiring there is the seven thunders. Um, I say is because those events are transpiring at this point in time. They have begun. So it's important to understand those events um, 
because they, 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 have, they, have, they have much to do with, with our salvation. If you will consider the time period of 1840 and the events that are transpiring there in terms of the foolish are not comprehending this light. And if you will consider some of the things we said earlier on, that the papacy had received a deadly wound in 1798, and of course this is following 1798. 1798 she received a deadly wound, and it is her, it is her sole purpose to regain her throne again but the power that sits upon the throne at this point in time is the United States of America at the point in time. So, but remember that, that, that the foolish virgins are carrying the papacy and they, don't, they, they do not comprehend this, this fact. The light that came down in 1840 was to eliminate the influence of the papacy in the hearts of those people. Had, they, had, the, had all the virgins comprehend the light United States of America would not, today's beginning, would not fulfill Bible prophecy in that she, would, she will speak as a lamb. So you have to conclude now, you have to conclude in your mind that as a result of the foolish virgins not comprehending the light, the, they became the gateway by which the papacy enters the glorious land. She enters the glorious land spiritually. And 1840 is the, is the place where, she, where that is being accomplished. Now, if you think, if you think, um, if you think of the gospel, remember that it is because of, doc, of the doctrine of Christ in our minds, in our hearts, that, the, that God the Father will sit upon the throne of our minds because of the doctrines of Christ in our minds. If the, gospel, if the gospel have its work, have its perfect work in us. In like manner, as a result of the doctrines of, of the papacy in the heart, Satan will sit upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. And this is what Ellen White is saying concerning the boast that Satan made in Isaiah chapter 14. Reading that statement to you again, she says, this compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to sit himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. It is through the doctrines of Rome that Satan will accomplish this purpose. So you have to, you have to now look at the two classes of people as carrying the throne of Christ or Antichrist. And you have to now look at that rendezvous point in 1840 where the angel of the east, the two angels from the east, one from the, bottom, one from the bottomless pit and the power from above, the sealing angel. And 1840 as being the point in time where those respective angels accomplishes the work either of Satan or of Christ. And as you know, the conclusion of it all is that the foolish virgins remain in the holy place with Satan sitting upon the throne and the wise going into the, in, into, into the holy place with Christ, with God sitting upon the throne of their minds. Most holy place, sorry. Um, the, the wise going into the most holy place with um, God sitting upon the throne of their minds. So it is it's, it's just simple principles of the gospel that give us the understanding of what's happening in 1840. So I can back up a bit to 1840 again and tell you that as a result of the foolish virgins not comprehending the light, um, the papacy enters the glorious land. But this is, this is happening under the proclamation of the first angel's message. Now, if you will go with me to the... To, to, Revelation chapter 14. Now, I, there are many themes I could bring out concerning you know, this chart here, but I feel the most important to bring out at this time is, um, I, feel, okay. I feel the most important theme to bring out is, is the little book, give you, an, give you an understanding of the little book um, at this point in time, because it is, 
It is that little book that, that will result in the separation of the two classes. One class seal with the seal of God and another class with the seal of Satan. Sunday law. Um, and it seems like reputation, I've said it before, you know, using different charts, but there are different ways to illustrate this very, this very point. Uh, in Revelation 14, verse 6, we read, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people, um, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of water. Remember the everlasting gospel was first preached in Eden as God passed his judgment upon the serpent and Adam and Eve. And in the everlasting gospel, God, God or Jesus promised that he would put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. If you will... If you will think back on what I was saying here concerning the time period of 1840 and how that Satan was entering the glorious land as the foolish virgins did not comprehend the light, um, you, can see that, you can see that one class is, is being, being possessed by the spirit of darkness and another class being possessed by the spirit of light, the Holy Spirit. Following that, following 1840, um, we have that the gospel, because of the power that came into the experience of the five wise, five foolish virgins, um, this power radiated out of America to every missionary outpost in the world. And as Ellen White says concerning this um, movement, she says, the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a manifestation of the power of God. And this power of the gospel went to every missionary outpost in the world. And it's obvious the same test comes to the five wise and the five foolish virgins. The foolish virgins who don't comprehend the light, um, what, what happens, again, is the same that happened to the, the, to the wise and the foolish virgins in the United States of America. The two classes are developed. And um, when that, is, when that reaches complete stage, we, we come to the point in time um, in 1843 where Daniel 12:12 12, 12 referred to that hour as the blessed hour, when both classes, both classes of, the, of the virgins had reached a stage of um, decision. They had made, the decision was fully made at that point in time, the, the, the seal basically was upon them, and now it, it, the time had come for the testimony. And we saw the testimony going forth in um, 1843, 44, and as a result of that, um, remember the disappointment came and the churches blocked the message, and Michael stood up. Now, these are the very events that are transpiring in the book of Daniel 11, 40 to 45. You go with me to Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And we all know the wording of it very well. Um, it says there, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And this is 1798. We know this is 1798 as the papacy was brought down by the king of the south. And remember what followed, the, 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 what followed this incident was Revelation, 11, Revelation 13, 11, this beast that is rising out of the earth. And, re, and this, is, this is where we, um, you can now visualize as this beast comes out of the earth as a result of the first part of verse 40. Um, it's carrying the two classes of people who are carrying, sorry, I should say, um, this beast, the people that, make, that makes up this power are carrying the papal, the papal doctrine and Christ. And the result is the foolish don't comprehend the light in 1840 and the papacy. The sequence began that led to 
the events of 40 to 45 being fulfilled under the Millerites time period, which I just went through. The second part of verse 40, if you drop down to it, after the colon, and the king and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, this obviously points to 1989, and in 1989, which is represented here on this, this point here, where, um, again, the, the Laodicean church had dropped down to an all-time low, and, and now... The book of Daniel is being used to resurrect, um, resurrect the people of God. 1989, again, we see here graphically demonstrated that the, the papacy got back or got up on top of the beast. She, 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 the papacy um, received um, arms, support from the United States of America to remove atheism. And I want you to reflect back on 1798. It was atheism that brought about the, that brought about the change of heads in 1798. And I want you to see that it is atheism in 1989, again, that is bringing about the change of heads. That is bringing about the change of heads. And at the same time, the history of 1798 is being repeated where um, the, the United States of America is carrying the papacy. And, you, and that can be clearly seen in, that can clearly be seen in 1989. As, as a result of that, as, the, as a result of this woman being carried by the beast, um, we can understand now the urgency of the angel of Revelation 18 descending. The angel of Revelation 18 is descending because there's a class of worshippers. There's there are two classes of worshippers, and there is a need to separate them. So, the events of 40 to 45, again, is beginning. As we, come up to, as we come up to this, to the point in time that repeats the history of 1840, what happens again, the foolish virgins are not comprehending the light. And that process is, on, that process is going on now. The foolish virgins who don't comprehend this light um, will result with Antichrist being the king that presides over them. Um, and what follows that, and remember that test comes to the United States of America first. The churches in the United States of America go through this, this test. And what follows that is verse 42, the, his, the, the event, the same, the same event that transpired in 1842 is transpiring on the verse 42. And we, we come up to the blessed time when the papacy, well, we come up to the time when the two classes will be fully developed. And that is Daniel 11, verse 43. In verse 43, we see that the papacy has control over the treasuries and over... Um, the, she has control over the monetary systems of the world after she has gained control of you know, the glorious land and Egypt. Um, remember what followed the blessed... Also, when the papacy has reached, when the papacy has reached her full power... Remember that the history of Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, if you just go there with me, um, just different ways of illustrating the same thing. Um, Revelation 11, verse 3, God had promised that he would give power unto his two witnesses, and they were to prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. They were to prophesy in the time of the papal reign of supremacy. So verse 43 is illustrating that the papacy has reached her, the, 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 the point of full power, and God is now preparing his servants to stand in that time period. Verse 44 illustrates the time when the testimony goes forth, as it went forth in, in 1843 to 44. And, of course, we know what followed that was that the, the churches re, re, um, blocked the message, and we know the papacy will do that in verse 45, or the churches rather, everyone, you know, under the, under the um, guidance of the papacy will, will block this message. And then what happens, what follows that is Michael standing up. So as you can see that the very events of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 
at the very events that transpired under the first and second angel's messages. Only they're transpiring under the third angel's message. They're transpiring under the third angel's message. So we see that the little book in the angel's hand, and I wish I had the quotations to read it from, oh, I think I can find it in the Great Controversy, page 355. Right, she says, the message itself sheds light as to the time when this movement is to take place. This is the everlasting gospel she's talking about. It is declared to be part of the everlasting gospel, and it announces the opening of the judgment. The message of salvation has been preached in all ages, but this message is a part of the gospel which could be proclaimed only in the last days, for only then would it be true that the hour of judgment had come. The prophecies present a succession of, of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. This is especially true of the book of Daniel, but that part of his prophecy which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on a fulfillment of these prophecies. But at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Um, she says, the, 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 the prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. Um, and as we, as we look at these events that are transpiring, um, concerning, and she says, not until we reach that, not until we reach that, not, not until we reach that point in time, she says, let me read it again. Um, this is especially true of the book of Daniel, but that part of the prophecy which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal till the time of the end. Not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on a fulfillment of these prophecies. But at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And what I really want to tell you about this, about this little book here is, well, she says something else about this little book. I prefer to bring that out instead. She says that, she says the unsealing of the little book, the actually unfolding of those events that were transpiring there, she says, was the message in relation to time. But this message, the message that was being proclaimed here, if you, if you look at the message, the everlasting gospel, which is a, the message to separate the wheat from the tears or the foolish from the wise, um, is actually describing or it's, it's, as, it's actually saying the, saying the same thing or it's actually describing the events that are transpiring under it. Um, the events that are transpiring under it is a separation. One class don't understand, and as a result of that, there's a division taking place, a separation of the two classes. One class received this light, the other class don't comprehend it, a separation. It took place in the United States of America, then the rest of the world, the blessed hour came, the testimony went forth, the message was blocked, Michael stand up. We see that this, 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 those, these are the events that transpired on the first and second angel's messages. And these are the very events that are transpiring right now on the third angel's message. But it's the same little book and the same test is coming to God's people at this point in time. And this is the reason why when she, when she quoted, when she quoted, um, second, second selected messages, page 104, she says the, little, the book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel which related to the last days. And then she quotes Daniel 12, 4, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. And then she quotes Revelation 10, 6, and if you go there with me, Revelation 10, 6, she says, when the proclamation was made, time shall be no more, the book of Daniel was now unsealed. You notice that when the events had transpired, and remember that the proclamation was made in, in um, 1844, and the book of Daniel was on seal in that the experience that the Millerites went through, the events that transpired under the first and second angel's messages was the unsealing of the little book. And she, so she, when, when it had reached its conclusion in 1844, the book was now open. And then she says, the revelation that Christ made to John in the seven thunders 
concerning the event that transpired there is to come to all inhabitants of the earth by the increase of that knowledge. I put the word that in. Shall, um, shall our people be prepared to stand in the latter days? It is important, as we can see now clearly, that the third angel's message and the first and second angel's message was about the very same issues, the little book that was transpiring there. So when you think of the very wording of the, first, the third angel's message, if any man worship the beast and his image. Now, the beast we know to be Catholicism, the woman. So, so let's suppose we, we took away the word beast and we put the woman there. And the image beast, we know it to, to be Protestant America. So you, let's, let's word it differently. Let's word it in the light of, of Revelation 17, verse, verse 8, verse 7. If any man worship the woman and the beast that carry of her, this is, the, this, is, this is what the third angel's message is saying to us. If any man worship the woman and the beast that carry of her. And this, was this, 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 was, this, this is what the little book was all about in, 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 the, in the time period of 1840 to 1844. Um, it was about the woman and the beast that carry of her. So in Revelation 10.7, if you look at Revelation 10.7 with me, and in closing... Revelation 10, 7, we read that, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. <clears throat> now there was a mystery of the woman and the beast that carry of her. And as we understand the unfolding of the little book, that mystery that mystery becomes clear as we understand, we should understand what, what, what the mystery of the woman and the beast is all about. And there's a mystery, there, there are mysteries being sounded from the seven thunders. Obviously, it brings light as concerning, the mystery, concerning the mystery of the woman and the beast. And of course, there is Christ formed within the hope of glory. And that, well, that's, that is exact, that's exactly what the angel, the sealing angel, um, came in 1840, that's that his purpose for coming down in 1840, to seal the spirit of Christ or to seal the character of Christ in the, in, in, in the hearts of his servants. So when we, when we, come, up to, when we come up to 1844, when, the conclusion, when, 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 when those prophecies had reached the conclusion, Revelation 10, 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, should be finished, as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. It is clear the importance of this little book, and remember that this little book is, is the light that is being depicted in the angel descending in Revelation 10. And it's that very light that is, that will, that, that is being depicted in the angel of Revelation 18 as he descends upon the earth. This is, we're now in the sprinkling time where this message begins to, it is, it is beginning to be comprehended. Well I, well, I can say the fullness of this message is here. Um, it, just has to, it just has to simmer and, and grow inside of Adventism till, it's, till it becomes a loud cry in the whole world. But God is saying that this little book was unsealed in 1844. And that experience of the Millerites, when it comes into our experience, God's church will proclaim this loud cry. Amen. <laughs>